Christopher has written for The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Salon, and The New York Times Magazine. He's written a nonfiction book, Rejuvenile. I love that title. And a fiction book, Plus One, which I cannot wait to read. And now he's put his multiple talents as both an artist and a writer into his newly released book, Good Trouble, Lessons from the Civil Rights Playbook. How timely that you have published this now. Good Trouble highlights the essential lessons that we can extract from the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s, which I remember all too clearly, so that we can move forward and create change today. It's a very thoughtful book, beautifully illustrated. You're so talented. And it will inspire both conversation and, hopefully, action. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Knoxon. Hi. Hello. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I love Seattle. Um, I have relatives here who I used to come visit as a boy. And so this has been a very important and special place for me. This is the end of a seven uh, city swing, um, which is super exciting for me because I, I get to meet people in every city that I go to and find out about what kind of actions and what kind of uh, events and issues are really important to them. So I feel like what I get to, out of this is learning. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do a little reading and then I'm going to do a little talking and some showing of pictures. And then hopefully we can have a little conversation. So I'm going to start, which what I haven't done yet is just by reading from the book, which and I'm going to start right at the beginning, because it sort of tells the origin story of how I got interested in this subject and started work on this thing. So I'm going right from the beginning. Two days after the election of Donald Trump, I was in Memphis. I was running on fumes on the third stop of a book tour that suddenly felt stupid and inconsequential. I was sleep deprived and dumbfounded and also raw and exasperated and more than a little terrified. But there I was with a free day in a city I'd never visited. I'd planned to go to Graceland, but now the idea of gawking at fab 70s interiors just kind of felt gross. So I took a cab downtown to the National Civil Rights Museum, thinking it would occupy an hour or two. The car pulled up to the listed address, and I got out, and I looked up, and there wasn't any museum. There was just this classic 60s roadside split-level motel. It looked kind of familiar, the patterned railing, the fold of the drapes, the letters in the bubbles on the sign above. I saw that wreath and I just stopped and I said, oh God, I didn't have any idea that this was the place. And without any warning and in a burst, I kind of just came undone. I started crying standing on the sidewalk at 11 a.m. on a Thursday, just a kind of full, ugly cry. Why? You know, the election of 2016 didn't feel like a political event. It felt like an asteroid hit. It felt like a dam broke. It felt like a sinkhole had swallowed up Main Street. It felt like 9-11. It felt like an absurd, apocalyptic nightmare. It felt catastrophic. And the campaign, that was bad enough. That felt awful too, but that felt like being underwater swimming to the surface, and I knew that soon we'd all pop out and we'd take a deep breath and it would all be okay. And then the election came and the surface was ice. We're stuck down here. We're still underwater. We're stuck in a country that's threatened by hard right ideologues, corporate superpowers, white supremacists, and grab them by the pussy predators. We're stuck in a churning boil of outrage and panic. It's easy to feel like that the whole democratic experiment is coming apart before our eyes. And it's worth stopping here for a moment to acknowledge what a lot of people would say to this kind of reckoning. No duh. 
Nothing I felt standing on the street in Memphis will be news to a lot of Americans. What felt apocalyptic to me is just an ongoing truth of life to a lot of Americans. I'm a privileged white guy. You might have guessed that. And as such, I will never truly understand the lived experience of systematic and generational injustice. Still, I know that all that honest, that, that honestly confronting and overcoming oppression will take all of us working together. We're all faced with the same central question. How do we go on? So after my little breakdown on the street, I headed inside. The museum is sort of contained within the Lorraine's facade. And it turned out that the National Civil Rights Museum has a lot to say about this particular historical moment. It's a story of despair transformed into resolve, of moral clarity focused against oppression, of a determined coalition finding new ways to resist an entrenched and hostile establishment. The mugshots of civil rights protesters alone, God. They're young and they're old and they're mostly black, but there are a few white folks. They're taunted and beaten and hosed and humiliated, and they should be angry, fearful, bitter. Maybe they are, maybe they were, but their faces have this poise and this dignity and this kind of purpose and this defiance. There's so much to learn. So at that point, I, after the election, I, people dealt with it in all the kinds of ways that they did. I have been carrying around a notebook like this since my last book. I wrote my last book longhand, and I started drawing as a sort of just hobby, um, obsessive doodling, really. And so my kind of therapy in the week after the election was just to draw mug shots. So I sat around and did you know page after page of these. Um, my kids thought I was a little crazy, which I guess I was. Uh, and then I just sort of set out to learn as much as I could um, and one of the first things I learned at the museum was about not only about the, the movement, but about the resistance to the movement, which was called at the time the resistance, ironically. And you know, you've got these guys, Bull Connor and Jim Clark, and you know, the, the rallies for George Wallace where uh, you know, they played really loud music and they would talk about outside agitators and communists and the lying media and they would heckle you know, protesters that were in the audience. And I was like, oh my god, this has all happened before. This is just an echo. Um, so you know, I just knew that there, this was the most effective, the response to this was the most effective citizen uprising in US history. And it had not only that kind of moral clarity that I was so desperate for, but strategies and know-how that I felt like could be applied at this moment. Um, I want to stop and just say that the book is full, filled with lessons. It's very didactic. I have never been, I was taught in journalism school to sort of show and don't tell. I'm telling a lot here. I just, I'm just telling. I feel like the time for telling is now. So there's lots of lessons. I'm going to give you guys six or seven tonight of just that are kind of top of mind. Uh, the book is filled with them. But all of this, anything you hear me say that you like tonight is really because of people like Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and Baird Rustin and Otis Moss III and Sharon Browse and these people who I talked to and learned from over the last couple of years. This is all their stuff. So um, just noted. First message that sort of busted a preconception I had was that civil rights was a popular uprising. I had always thought of it as, you know, Martin Luther King, the march from Montgomery to Memphis, this kind of uh, male minister-led political movement. Um, and the fact is that, you know, the leaders were trying to catch up with mostly the church ladies and the kids that were really driving these actions. Um, Joanne Robinson was a divorced 
a university professor in Montgomery and had been trying to get a, a bus boycott going for years before 1955. And she had failed. And two other women had been arrested in the same year that Rosa Parks had been for the same crime on the same bus service. And they didn't do anything about it because one of them was a 17-year-old dark-skinned agitator who was, was pregnant. And the other one was uh, from out of town and was thought to be not sort of presentable enough. So the day that uh, Rosa Parks was arrested, Joanne and her friends, she had a little activist gang, and they ran back to her office and printed out the manifesto about the, about the boycott and then hand delivered them all over town that morning saying, don't ride the buses. Um, you know, Martin Luther King gets all the credit, and it's amazing that he was there at that moment and was able to really take the leadership. But it was really women like this who made the thing work and who had the plans already. Uh, the second lesson is that change doesn't happen in safe spaces. Uh, my publisher didn't like this very much because they were worried that I was going to offend some liberals. But I, one of the, big, the, the, the most glaring lesson that you learn when you read about these actions were how, how uncomfortable the participants had to be. You know, they put their bodies in places where they were facing danger, discomfort, ridicule, and harm. Um, you know, today the activism in the circles I run in is mostly online petitions. Maybe you ring a doorbell, um, you know, you, maybe you wear a silly hat. But like actual putting your body in a place where you're going to confront an oppressor is what the whole movement was based on. There were direct action, there were boycotts, there were freedom rides. You know, the, the thing that really turned the movement and led to some of the most significant legislation was the action in Birmingham where they were turning uh, hoses and dogs on people. That was a deliberate and uh, escalating campaign that was called Project C, and the C was for confrontation. So, I mean, Martin Luther King is known as this uh, champion of peace and nonviolence, and he was, but he also knew how to apply pressure. It was about pressure and not about politics or policy. So we can talk about politics and policy, and there's obviously an important place for that, but the movement really worked by applying pressure. So my, you know, the lesson that I take from that is that you really do have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. The next lesson is the, the value of faith. Um, too long, I feel like, the, the discussion of religion and politics has been dominated by these kind of fundamentalists who want to talk about abortion or prayer or gays and, you know, but you look at this history and religion was not, there's no doubt that it was a force for freedom and organization and power. Um, and you know, it was also not, it obviously grew and took root and was organized through the black church, but it was a very multi-faith coalition. That's my attempt to get uh, uh, Abraham Heschel. Um, this is sort of a dream team of people who were involved. Uh, you know, there were Catholics, there was um, Thoreau, there was Gandhi. All these people had their sort of imprint. Um, I think probably the, the greatest spiritual teaching that uh, Dr. King and James Lawson and John Lewis really attached themselves to was from the Hindu faith, which is this idea of satyagraha, which is soul force. And that really carried through all of the actions, this idea of a sort of unifying um, uh, thread of humanity, that an injury to you is an injury to me, that we're all in this together. And that's a very deep spiritual um, idea, which I think the left hopefully can begin to embrace again. I'm very excited about people like William Barber and others who are sort of reanimating the progressive cause with sort of spiritual ideas. Fourth lesson is that outrage is an activism. Um, a friend of mine in LA talks about the fact that, you know, this was early days of the resistance and everybody's talking about the resistance. That seems to have sort of died down a little bit. But he would say that, you know, you are not the resistance. 
you are your resistance. Meaning like you have to find the thing that makes sense for you that uh, doesn't mean getting into an argument on Facebook or, or uh, you know, thinking that by staying informed of all the latest outrages that that somehow means you're participating. Guess what, it doesn't. You don't have to know or, and have a strong opinion about every cycle. Like it's hard to disengage, but I think the most successful activists have their thing and they stay laser focused on it. Um, this is Georgia Gilmore. She was a, a mother of six um, in Montgomery when the when the uh, boy when the bus boycott started, and she was she was uh, cooking in a commercial kitchen. And when her bosses found out that she was involved in the boycott, they fired her. And so she just kept cooking. She made sandwiches for people, and then she made chicken dinners, and then she opened up her kitchen, and then she invited other women in, and they just kept cooking, and they started selling their meals, and they funneled all the money back into the boycott. And at the end of the year plus boycott, uh, she contributed more financial support to that effort than any other single donor. Um, and I love her. I just think that, you know, do what you do. Right? Uh, the fifth lesson here is that it's important to fight oppression and not oppressors. Dr. King talked a lot about this, which is that he wasn't after uh, winning. He wasn't interested in retaliation. He was interested in reconciliation. And, you know, it's so easy now and then to focus on the bad guys and to play into the dynamic of this being a war, of us versus them, and we just need to beat them, and he just needs to go to jail, right? <laughs> um, I was at a panel with Andrew Young last fall. He, you know, he went on to be the mayor of Atlanta and a, a, a UN ambassador, and he said quite clearly that it was a very specific and thoughtful effort to not talk about George Wallace or Bull Connor or any of these guys. They didn't name them. They talked about the change that they wanted, and they stayed totally focused on that. I was at uh, David Domke's lecture last night, and you know, I was hearing one of I think six or seven lectures, but it was all about Trump. And I just wanted to say, like, don't you know about Voldemort? Like, <laughs> don't say his name. Anyway, um, this is uh, Jim Clark. He was the the uh, sheriff in. Selma around the time of the voter registration drive that led to Bloody Sunday. And I mean, he is about as, you know, villainous a figure in American history as you're likely to find. He, you know, wore a pin that said never, and he had a cattle prod, an electric cattle prod that he would shock people with. He jailed 3,500 people for peacefully protesting. And one day when he was out knocking heads, he fell down with a heart attack and he was put into the hospital. And the next day, the protesters showed up at the uh, hospital, and it was raining, and they kneeled down, and they prayed for him to get better. Um, and the minister who was involved in that action said at the time, and has written since, that it was not a cynical act. They weren't doing this. They were trying to show that this was a movement about healing. And it was also super smart politically because they got tons of coverage and it really did announce the movement as something different than people were used to. So uh, the last lesson I'm gonna share with you is about joy. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who I love, writes about uh, the fact that activists are professional scolds. And a lot of times in the social justice world, there's like this dour, uh, humorless intensity. And civil rights was not any of those things. Um, one of the things I learned is that people were singing all the time. You know, the mass meetings were just wall-to-wall -wall music. Um, and, you know, the, Bayard Rustin, who most of you probably knew about, know a lot about, I didn't know anything about him, and I, I, somebody's got to make this movie. Um, born in Pennsylvania, a Quaker, had this incredible elocution. He talked like Cary Grant um, and was an activist from early on 
a football player who would like knock people over and then quote Elizabethan stanzas while he was picking them up. Uh, was jailed during World War II because of conscientious objector and desegregated the mess hall and learned to play the lute in prison. Um, his boyfriend gave it to him and he put out an album of Elizabethan songs and Negro spirituals. Um, and then went to India and learned from Gandhi's people. And then when the Montgomery bus strike started, he was already an elder, went to Montgomery and taught MLK about Satyagraha and the ideas of nonviolence and got MLK himself to throw away his guns. So this is the guy. And then when it came time to do the march, which Kenny, my uncle, was there as a peace protector, right? Or as a marshal. Um, he uh, decided where the porta potties were going to go, um, got the sound system fixed, you know, was logistically involved in every detail, and also was the guy at the front of the party having the best time. So I don't know, he kind of represents to me this idea of it's got, and it, in his biography, he talks about, they asked him what his legacy was. And I mean, he could have named a hundred different things, and he said, I had fun. So the last image I want to leave with you is um, these shoes. These are Dr. King's boots. They're on display at the King Center in Atlanta, which is kind of a crappy museum. It's got these sort of um, display boxes filled with stupid trinkets and stuff. But there's these. And when I saw them, I just like, I felt like I could just put them on and start walking. Um, he walked from... Selma to Montgomery and these about 50 miles. And you know, more than anything, I think that's what the movement means to me. And I think that leaves us with is it's about walking, it's about moving, it's about putting our bodies in space and making our values into action. So that's what I got for slides. Oh, and I'm gonna turn this off. And I would love to uh, answer any questions hear your any comments, talk to Uncle Kenny about what it was like to be a marshal and what his thoughts on housing, maybe not. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? Come on. Yes. Do it. So I was especially struck by your comments about like, you know, raging on Facebook as an activism. Um, I have somebody who's very close to me who thinks it is. <laughs> and um, I want to buy him your book, but I'm afraid that he's not going to like that. And I'm wondering if you're, if you could say more about like what, how you would, how you would talk to somebody if this is so didactic and if this is really kind of meant to sort of stir up the, the young masses. Like, how do you, how do you address what I think my friend is going through, which is this sort of uh, helplessness about their ability to make a difference and and giving up that power that they have on, on social media, like because they do have a lot of power and they do get to have these good conversations. But then to enter a movement, um, you gotta sorta start from the ground up and it's not very exciting and you don't know where to go and what to do. So I'm kinda just curious. I mean, I can only speak from what I've been learning from a lot of other activists about how, you know, one of the questions I always ask is like, how do you find your way in? Like, it's so overwhelming and it's, it feels so full of despair and complicated that like if you're on the outside and all you've been doing is just like throwing your rage bombs into the middle and not actually taking action, where do you, where, where's your entrance? Um, and what a lot of them will say is join something, <laughs> right? Like I joined this group called the Center for Popular Democracy. I'm giving all my author proceeds to them um, they do a lot of direct action, and uh, I went to the Capitol in Washington last summer around the healthcare debate, and they trained me to get arrested and uh, spend some time in jail, which felt like an important thing to do at that moment. And I never would have done that, you know, just on my own. I wasn't going to, like, go to... I had to join a group that had a program. Um, I met with some people last night who were associated with Domkey, who do 
activism through email. Like once a month they get together and they just sort of decide what's important to them, learn an issue, and then do it. I feel like bodies in space, man, like gather. Um, get people together, right? Like that's how you fight the sort of alienation of the virtual activist world. Um, so I would get your friend and like go to a meeting. I mean, a lot of, you know, and some of those meetings could be super frustrating because a lot of what has, has been happening for the last two years is, and I, I don't think it's happening as much, but I remember during the first year where I was going to two or three meetings a week, and what you would just hear is, I hate him so much, 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 what we call outgassing, right? Just like, ugh. And I had, I was done with that after about the first month. I was like, all right, what are we doing, you know? What are we doing? Um, is it, Domke's group is called Common Cause? Common Purpose. Common Purpose. And they're local and doing really good stuff. And just a, a comment to be fair to Domke, you're, you're, you took a snippet from his whole series because I think he would agree with you about uh, don't fight the oppressor, but fight oppression. Right. What he's doing is just defining the characteristics of this the current president and, and that all those things that keep him in office and all those things that keep him in office are the things that we need to address maybe. Got an answer for him. Yeah. yeah. So there are all these children in these camps. What would all of these people that you have gained wisdom from be doing now? You mean the the immigrants on the border? Yeah. I went down to one of those facilities with a big group of protesters and uh, we marched and hollered and sang and laid down in front of uh, trucks and you could actually hear kids from over the wall yelling at us in Spanish. It was really intense. Um, and I don't, look, did that get any kids out? I don't know, but no, it didn't. Um, but the pressure of that moment, clearly he had to walk back, right? So like, it's still going on, obviously, but I, th but I think the civil rights movement would say, you know, flood the space, like put your body, uh, who is it, uh, Brian Stevenson talks about proximity, right? Like get your body close to where the problem is. Um, and in LA, that's an hour and a half. And it was amazing. We were, you know, left on a Saturday morning and we were there. Yeah, Julia. Um, I would also say there, you know, throw, make a pitch for while it can feel the national stuff can feel overwhelming and what can we do, we're out here in Seattle, there's so much we can do at the state level and there's so many different, to your friend, so many different um, good things we can get done at the state level to fight the same forces and make our state a beacon of Progressivism, what, whatever, you know, what we want or what you want, and I, I don't know what your issues are, your friends' issues, but there's just a ton we can do. And Fuse Washington is a really great state focused, Olympia focused advocacy organization. But because I do get overwhelmed, I, you know, I can write, I can, you know, I can doorbell on a congressional campaign, and I did that, but. Um, there's great stuff we can do at the state level, locally, um, during our current legislative session. So, anyway, or city, county. Right. Right. I wonder what everybody thinks about getting out the vote. Uh, in those early days of the civil rights movement, there was just so much voter registration and so much getting out the vote. Um, and it seems to me that in this last election cycle, a whole lot of new people got excited about who had not been getting out to vote over the years. And does that have any sex appeal to folks anymore? <laughs> Voting is super sexy, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, everything's got sex appeal. The circles I run in, there's lots of talk about um, sending delegations and groups of people to um, register folks. So it's obviously hugely important. And in, in, I mean, I don't know, in LA, 
we don't think about it that much, but I know it's one of these things where like you have to go where the people who aren't registered are, right? So that requires at all, yeah. And I just learned from you guys that here it's all by mail, right? See, that's incredible. Yeah. And your your rates are like 70 some. And it may surprise you to learn that in California it's like 11, 15%. That's a high turnout. Isn't that depressing? So it's in our own neighborhoods or we have to just, you know, right. or I like the idea of there was a lot, there were a lot of people from Seattle, from King County, going out to the Republican districts or the swing districts. Right, we did that too. All yeah. the way up to Spokane. Right. And even though they didn't win the Spokane race, I don't know. It felt good. Yeah, I spent more time in Orange County this past year than I ever have before. <laughs> But we flipped, we flipped six districts. I mean, personally. So, you're welcome. Um, anybody else? Yeah. From the 60s, the news that we got was much more homogeneous. When something like May Live, Ray or Sir or the Riot, it would be the same on ABC, NBC, and CBS. I was wondering, why do you think that there was a Fox News back in the 60s and how that would be presented? That divide that we have entirely different narratives now. Yeah, I mean, I, may, uh, I make a point in the book that it, like the, the importance of television can't be underestimated in the fact that live television just happened to come about almost exactly around the time that this was. So every night, people were turning on the television and watching this stuff happen. And I think that obviously fueled the sort of public response. Now, you know, everybody's so atomized and we're all in our little little funnels and I think social media is the new television, right? Like that the influence of that can be felt really profoundly. And I, you know, if there was a Fox News then, it wouldn't have, I mean, yeah, that would have been a lot harder for uh, those messages and those images to get out. And now, you know, again, like just everybody in their own little funnel of like feedback loopness. Um, it's awful. And how do you, I mean, how do, I'm hoping that like a book like this gets through some of those barriers, but who knows, you know, I think you just have to keep plugging away, which isn't a great answer, but yeah. I you know in the past movements there was often an attempt to divide, you know, the group that was protesting whether the original civil rights were the women's rights and the civil rights got kind of got split into different camps. Did you see that in the sixties as well? For sure, yeah. Um they talk about the big six, which were the, the guys who were on the cover of time, they were credited with the march, they were credited with they were the public Figures and it was John Lewis and it was uh, Martin Luther King and there was the labor leader and uh, anyway those guys fought all the time <laughs> and there were brawls over really fundamental issues. Um, you know John Lewis was so angry at the leadership on the day of the March on Washington that he his speech was rewritten like nine times before he finally was able to deliver it because they kept taking stuff out that they thought was too radical. So like this idea that we all have to be on the same page and all agree, th th it's not the case with these guys. And, and in fact, like, but they also sort of, there's a lot of examples of when the big six and when the different factions all completely coalesced and came together behind their common purpose. So, I mean, I was just reading a story about the Women's March and how that movement has kind of fractured. And I do think that the low turnout this year is probably partially due to that. So, I mean, h how do you keep these various interest groups all on the same overall path and yet still maintain everybody's individual integrity? I don't know. But I, I do know that it's not just about a strong leader. Like, that's something that seems to come straight through here, which is like, 
This has got to be a leader full movement where everybody's kind of participating. Um, we, I mean, I think that before Trump and before this past couple of years, there was this sense that like, Obama's got it. <laughs> you know, we've got our guy and we can just stop paying attention. Nope. Yeah. I haven't read your whole book, but you have a part about beloved community at the beginning. And there was an article by Bernice Raymond Johnson that we used at Pacific Oaks in the olden days um, called Coalition Politics, in which she talks about don't expect to be comfortable in the coalition and what you were talking about, about risk. And, you know, that somehow, I think. Many of us liberal leftist activists have lost sight of the discomfort that you have to engage in. And she talks about, she distinguishes between the coalition and home. And, you know, go home if you want to cry and then go back. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a great article. It's, I think it was in, um, it was in the streets called My Back or Home Girls, one of those anthologies of the olden days. <laughs> Cry at home, leave your tears in your bedroom. Right, but it's a great article. I'll see if I can find a copy. Okay. Great. All right. Anybody else? Should we make some good trouble and sign some books? Oh, wait, hold on, one more. I mean, I, I, I really like your lessons and the chapter headings. You know, I think each one of those we've heard before, we know, and, the, and there's no one single thing that we need to do, but. Um, courage is certainly, and Dr. talked about that last night, uh, putting yourself on the line, getting engaged and involved. But I was wondering, now you've done this research and you've been around, you've talked to lots of people in the movement, what is your sense of how they're getting organized or we all can get organized today to address the oppressions that all of us are feeling? And some groups feeling much, much more than, than we. <clears throat> Where are the churches now in organizing? Where are the, the, the people's movement? The right, right. women's movement yeah. uh, is, is alive and well, maybe somewhat fractured, but... Um, have you heard? Yeah, I mean, there are signs I, that I... William Barber, have you, have you gotten hip to him yet? He's, he's, to me, like the kind of natural heir and he revived the Poor People's Campaign, which was Dr. King's work when he was uh, assassinated. And they, uh, he, he started Moral Mondays, and he's just a ridiculously charismatic um, and very driven figure. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's synagogues and churches and um, a kind of uh, moral crusade happening on that level. Uh, but I mean, how, what do we do right now? I guess to my mind is like, find your grassroots group and get active, right? Which is kind of pedestrian, but like it's, it's putting on the boots. Um, but you know, where is the, the groundswell movement? I think it's kind of in, in this social media fragmented atomized age, it's sort of percolating all over the place. And a lot of it's getting outgassed through just the news cycle and the... Well, yeah, and, and I think your point about outgassing, and, and I, I experienced the same thing because of my disgust and hatred of right. this man, and then it, you become paralyzed. Yep. In that. And whether that's, that's conscious or not, I don't know. Like, are they deliberately going, all right, how do we just wear them down? <laughs> Are there meetings where they do that? I don't know. It's the irony of the, of the situation. A, a, a guy who uses Twitter as his platform yeah. and has 50 plus million followers is able to grab the attention and piss off half the country or 80% of the country and 20% are just with him and that keeps him in power. Uh, because he, he believes that any news is good news. Yeah, and we need to stop Well, and yeah, it's 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 hard, but I think it and the media is not going to help us, and no one's going to help us except ourselves in terms of not giving him the oxygen, right? Like just he's like a temperamental toddler. You don't give in to the tantrum. You just kind of right. Anyway, Nancy stole. Nancy what? Nancy has souls. 
to unify the country. It's called Medicare for All. Right. It's a civil rights issue. It's a health issue. It's an organization issue. And that is what, I mean, if people will want to get unified, there it is. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Can I ask a question? Oh, please. We've got a question from the cameraman. My thing is kind of, you know, carrying on about what he was talking about. And that is, I was listening to Mike Malloy the other night, and, and his, what he was little rap was talking about was that this government shutdown is just a symbol of the weakness of our movement. Because, uh, you know, if those TS, TSA agents would just all strike, that would be the end of it, right? Right. And if there's any time in our history that we ever needed a general strike, it's now. We're really up against it. If you talk about climate change, I'm just in a deep depression mm. about what we're facing, and we're right on right right on the edge on the edge. And and so we need to just shut the whole thing down, but it's not happening. And so uh, if I know there's a lot of people that actually know that, or they have some sense of it, so what's stopping it? What's stopping a general strike? What's stopping just uh, a mass rebellion, you know? Yeah. Gosh, I mean, you know, I feel like people now, as opposed to in the 50s, and at the height of the sort of movement movement, and I, I want to just say, Obviously, it didn't start in 1955, and it didn't end in 68. Like, it is as old as slavery and as new as now. So, like, when I talk about the civil rights movement, I'm not just talking about that time. But at that time, people were having their rights and their safety and their families affected every day. And it was a, a, a constant assault. And I think for most people, for large parts of America, they are like in a kind of bubble of false security and watching their sort of rights and privileges and comforts slowly erode. But it's, you know, it's the, the frog in the boiling water. You know, we've got our Twitter and we've got our, um, our rental storage place to put all our Chinese made goods and we've got our stand up routines and we've got our like feedback loop of you know, comfort media, and, you know, general strike. I got, you know, uh, Kendall Jenner is doing something, right? Like, people are just not engaged. You know, we've got lefty agitators who are ready to shut it down and burn it down, but I think most people just don't, aren't in, they aren't in the, in the discussion. Yeah. What's happened to the media? I mean Back in the day, the media used I mean, I've watched it because I was I was a newsroom reporter for the beginning of my career, and then um, and just the you know my editor at Abrams was laid off today, so I'm not doing another book with them. <laughs> but like print media is is dying, and I was in New York uh, a few months ago, and I was wandering around, and I and I went into a Samsung shop. First, I had I'd had lunch with a friend who does a, a pretty serious magazine called Tablet. And she was telling me about how they have basically restructured the whole publication to be a nonprofit. Because they've realized that like they're never going to make it. So now they're just out there hustling for benefactors. And it's just a magazine that's doing news, right? And then I was wandering around, and I ended up in a Samsung factory. And there were like 600 people there for a Fuck Jerry, uh, internet, um, Instagram, viral discussion. And it's these guys who do a, they have an Instagram account where they do memes. And out of that, these three guys are now multi-billionaires who are doing like these massive multimedia campaigns. And I was like, that's it. That's it right there. Like print journalism has to like restructure itself to and these guys doing pictures of, you know, whatever, are like showered in resources. So that's what's happened to the media. It's pretty depressing. I don't want you to yes, stop. I gotta stop. Do